physicsinfo.co.uk Another in the series of Physics GCSE Tutorials. Topic 15 Forces and Matter Separate Science Stretching and Bending Stretching, bending or compressing an object, such as a spring, requires more than one force. A suspended spring may be pulled down by a weight, that's a force, but it is at the same time pulled up by the stand that's supporting it. The spring is suspended from a clamp stand with a mass hanger hanging from the bottom. 50 gram mass has already been added. The hanger is set up at zero. So 50 grams is now added and the extension recorded. 2.1 centimetres. Another 50 grams is added, so that's two added masses, and again the extension recorded. 4.4 centimetres. And another 50 grams. Note the use of the reference point at the bottom of the mass hanger. 6.5 centimetres. 1 more mass. 8.5 centimetres. And another mass is added. Ten point six centimetres. And finally, the last mass, and this will give us six readings. 12.8 centimetres. To improve the experiment, the readings could be repeated as the masses are unloaded. And here are the results. Grams are converted to newtons by multiplying by the value of g. And, as always, here is the inevitable graph. For historical reasons, to do with the original testing machines, force is always plotted up the side and extension along the bottom. I know force was our independent variable, but the original machines were set up to see how much force was required to stretch by a fixed amount. As always, the graph should be as big as possible with sensible axes. So in this case, working in centimetres along the bottom going from 0 to 13 and working in newtons up the side going from 0 to 3.5. Zero, 0, once again, is a valid point and should be plotted. The plots clearly produce a straight line. A line of best fit should be drawn with a ruler going through 0, 0. The gradient of this line will be force over extension, or F over X. The gradient is constant for any particular spring, and this is called the spring constant, K. This graph produces a straight line going through the origin. It is directly proportional. And this straight line shows that the relationship is linear. There are two equations that relate to this graph. The spring constant K is equal to the force divided by the extension, or K equals F over X. The energy transferred in stretching the spring, E, is equal to a half kx squared. You need to know the first and be able to use the second. 
Under small loads, a spring is elastic as it bounces back to its original shape. If something stretches and then remains distorted, this is called inelastic distortion. And this could happen to a spring under a very large load, for example. It turns out an elastic band isn't really elastic. And what we're going to do this time is load the elastic band with 50 gram masses and try and keep the time interval between each change the same. We'll then unload them and plot a graph the results. At first sight, it would appear that the loading and unloading characteristics of the elastic band are slightly different. This is because as you stretch an elastic band, bonds are breaking and remaking and the band gets very slightly warmer. Here are the results for the elastic band in a table. I haven't converted the grams into newtons because I'm simply going to draw this as an example of the graph for an elastic band. And the shape won't change if I don't do the conversion. This elastic band experiment is a suggested practical. It's not in the learning outcomes. So I guess they can only ask you questions relating to the graph, for example. This time I'm going to put added mass along the bottom, the independent variable, and the extension in centimetres up the side. I'll plot the points for when I loaded the elastic band in black pen. and the unloading in red pen. A line of best fit shows a typical hysteresis curve, typical for an elastic band. And this area between the two curves is the amount of energy used up in heating the band when you stretch it. If you swim underwater, you appreciate that there is a huge mass of water above you and a large pressure which increases with depth. You may not realize it, but the same thing is true for the air above you. The higher you go, the fewer particles, the lower the atmospheric pressure. Now that air also pushes down on the water. And as this demonstration shows, the air pressure is the same on the surface of the liquid, no matter what the shape of the container. The height of the liquid, shown by the dotted line, is consistent. As seen previously with the gas, the pressure exerted by a fluid causes a net force normal to any surface. So the liquid particles collide with the surface and rebound off, but there is a component perpendicular to the surface of the container. 
The formula used to calculate pressure is pressure equals force over area. And you are expected to know this. Finally, the units of pressure are newtons per meter squared or pascals. A demonstration with two different sized syringes and an incompressible fluid shows that the smaller surface area on the small syringe means that less force is required to move the big syringe. Rearranging the equation gives you force equals pressure times area, so the smaller area requires less force. There are numerous potential calculations from the area of the heel of a shoe to having to explain why a hammer for breaking glass has a very small point or even that a thumbtack has a narrow point. Pressure in liquids. If pressure varies with the mass of particles above an object, density must be a factor. More dense liquids contain a greater mass of particles in the same volume. The formula for calculating the pressure in a column of liquid takes this into account. The pressure in a column of liquid is equal to the height times the density times gravitational field strength. This demonstration shows simply how the pressure changes with height of liquid. The jet at the top doesn't go as far as the jet at the bottom because it has less height of liquid above it. and a second demonstration where you can see that as the height of liquid in the measuring cylinder increases, the distance the jet travels increases as well. As the liquid goes down in the measuring cylinder, the pressure reduces and the jet coming out of the bottom doesn't travel as far. An object immersed or floating in a liquid or a gas is subject to an upwards force. This is called upthrust. This force acts at 90 degrees to the surface of the object. Upthrust measured in newtons is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Whether an object sinks or floats depends on upthrust and the weight and the density of the fluid. The wood floats because the mass of the wood that's in the water is less than the mass of the water displaced. If you like, it should be weight. The aluminium block, on the other hand, sinks because the weight of the block is much greater than the weight of the water displaced. A sachet of tomato ketchup has almost exactly the same density of water, but there's a little bit of air. If you squeeze the container, water is incompressible, so the air inside the sachet squeezes, the density increases, and the sachet falls down. When you stop squeezing the container, the density is slightly less than water, and the sachet comes up again. This is often called the Cartesian diver. A lava lamp basically consists of wax in water. Now they have very similar densities, but when the wax is heated, it spreads out just a little bit, the particles open up. And because it therefore has a lower density, it rises to the top of the tube. But once it gets to the top, it cools down again, its density increases and it falls to the bottom. This is very much like convection current in air. Hot air rises because its density is much less than the surrounding cold air. And that's just three examples. And that's it. Thank you for watching.